How many of you are excited to be here this morning? You are the undefeated one, my light and my salvation. When the wicked, my enemies and my foes, seem appalled me to eat of my flesh, the stumbled and fell. Come on, put your hands together. Omnipotent, almighty. Defender, my victory, my refuge, the one I run to, you are the God, you are the God of the breakthrough. Come on, clap your hands, everybody shout. Come on, say, breakthrough, breakthrough. You are the God of the breakthrough. When I can't see my way through, and I really don't know what. My enemies and my foes came upon me to eat of my flesh to stumble in hell. Oh, omnipotent, almighty defender, my victory, my refuge, the one I run to. You are the God. You are the God of the breakthrough.
bless your name, Jesus.
Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Come and sing it out. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my comfort.
your hands and let's speak the name of Jesus over our lives, over our family, over everything about us. Let your hands and say the name of Jesus. Call the name of Jesus here. Hallelujah. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and I speak Jesus Cause your name is power Your name is healing And your name is life Break every stronghold Shine through the shadows Burn Jesus, yes, Lord, over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression. I speak Jesus. Oh, your name is power, your name is healing. Your name over every enemy and Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus how Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every Oh, 
speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Praise the Lord. Let out of your mouth begin to flow praise and begin thanksgiving. Come on, begin to just say, God, you're a good God in my life. No matter the circumstances I'm going through, Lord, you, you are in control. The name Jesus is power over every circumstances, over every difficulty, over every challenge. The name Jesus, just begin to lift up that name Jesus in your own life. Say, Father, I thank you that all the way long that you've been faithful, that you've been good, that you never change, that there's nothing impossible to that name Jesus that I can stand today and glorify your holy and awesome name. When you give praise to him, you give him power and the faith to say, God, you're able to do it again and again and again in my life. Lord, we give you praise. We give you the adoration, Lord. We know that you're faithful. That you, we know that, Lord, that you did it in the past and you're able to do it again in my life, Lord. No matter the circumstances, no matter the challenge I face, Lord, that you are faithful, that you are good. There's nothing impossible to my God and if you believe that put your hands together for Jesus come on who's good and he is good all the time come on somebody somebody say my God is good and he's good all the time come on somebody amen we want to welcome you to hunger Jen greet your neighbor on your right and your left tell him I'm so excited to be in the presence of God with you today there's so many new faces those of you in the first sanctuary in the second sanctuary those of you watching us online let us know where you're watching us from you're part of our family as you take your seats in the presence of God guys a great update today. We have poured our first phase of our slab, basically half the building. We're super excited. Thank you all who, who have joined us, who have helped us, all the volunteers that came out. We really appreciate that. We have another pour to go here coming up. We'll announce that shortly. Until now, things were going down, down, down. From today, one more, one more push, and from that point, we will go up, 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 up. 
Put your hands together. Amen. Here at Hungry Gen, we are going from glory to glory to glory. Amen. Live viewers, people in Second Sanctuary, we are going from glory to glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Ah, okay. So I see you guys refer to yourselves as Second Sanctuary and online viewers. Amen. We got to get this figured out. Amen. God is good. He's an awesome God. How many of you enjoyed worship? Amen. Let's stay in that atmosphere of worship because God is faithful. He is mighty God. Amen. Let's not go from glory to glory during worship and then kind of take a nosedive because we go into a time of giving and offering. Amen. Let's keep that cheerful heart. Amen. That's what God is looking for. He's not looking, well, how much do you got today? He's looking for a cheerful heart. Amen. And we give cheerfully. We get to give cheerfully into the kingdom of God. It is a fertile soil that we're building. Amen. We saw it on the screen. So many, you know, people sometimes, well, where does, where, where's, where's my money going? Well, if you're not a member, become a member. Then you can join our members night where we go over everything. You can see dollar signs. You can see what's going on and what's happening. Our kids, our, our youth ministry, it's not growing without finances. Amen. I don't know how many of you can live and survive and pay all your, your, uh, your, your needs uh, freely without finances. But personally, I need finances to pay for my stuff. And the Lord says, how much more important is my kingdom? How much more important is my temple, my home, where I reside? Amen. And we're his children. Amen. And he wants to give to you. That way you can become a kingdom investor in Jesus' mighty name. How many of you believe that? Amen. Sorry. I'm going to invite Paul up. He's, uh, he's the man guided by the Spirit of God to uh, lead this project. And so I'm going to let him speak to you about that real quick. I'm Paul. Some people hear Paul, Paul, but now you can put a face to it. Um, I appreciate all you guys. I uh, just wanted to say thank you for everybody that served and helped last week. I wanted to give a hand to those people. Can you guys do that? Um, we're a family growing. So having said that, I want to invite those who are able to help out, we have a pour coming up Tuesday. Uh, concrete starts flowing at 6 o'clock, so if somebody can be there, 5.45 a.m. Uh, it's about from 6 to about 9.30. We encourage anybody to come out that is able to... You're not going to be physically pouring concrete or tending to the concrete. We just need help moving the hose around. It's just heavy. Um, you can kind of see it on the, on the video. We need about 40 people to sign up to help out with that. We would greatly appreciate it. Uh, one of our next steps that we'll have is the following week, uh, our materials are being dropped for our walls. We're going to start building some walls soon. So I want to encourage anybody that has carpenter skills um, that want to come out and help out, start framing Building those walls, um, we're going to start that the following week. So I just wanted to update you guys with that. God bless you. Thank you for all that have helped. Looking forward to seeing you on Tuesday morning. Amen. Give it up for God. Amen. Paul is located literally right outside the sanctuary doors. As soon as you go out, look to your left. He is there and he is ready to sign you up for whatever it is that you can physically do to help. Amen. Even that there is a form of giving. Amen. Isn't God good? Amen. Cheerfully. We give cheerfully in Jesus' mighty name. So he'll be taking names down. If you say, you know what? I, I just kind of, my, my schedule is sporadic. I don't know when I have the time, but when can I be there? I asked Paul, they're usually there from 8 a.m. Now this is not for the poor. That's at six o'clock. So be there at 545. But ongoing, if you're like, you know, I really want to help out. I just don't know when to show up. They're normally there from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. 
So if you just happen to be in the neighborhood, nothing really to do, and you've already ate lunch, go show up. Show up, help out, move stuff around. You see, can we see that hose again? Amen. Okay, just hold it there for a second. How many see that hose? Are we a church of deliverance or not? I saw that and I'm like, man, that looks like a serpent spirit right there, but look at how we're manhandling it. We got the spirit working for us now. Amen. And it's doing a good deed in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, somebody. Okay, on to, on to the good stuff. Amen. God is good. Paul, we thank you and we appreciate you. Pray for Paul. As you have time, pray for him that God would continue to give him guidance, give him wisdom for this project in Jesus' name. Amen. Quick question before I get into it. I promise, Pastor Vlad, I won't make it long. I know we got guest speakers. How many of you here, now listen carefully, how many of you are hopers? Oh, good, good. Don't, don't, don't continue to answer because it's a trick question. That's great for those of you who answered. Hope is, hope is good. The Bible talks about hope. Now, how many of you guys are believers? There we go. You know, Jesus Christ called us to believers. He said, be believers of the word. Amen. He called us to believe and to believe is to have faith and to have faith requires action. Amen. Faith is not a stagnant. It's not stagnant. It's an action. Amen. And when you stand on faith, you move and you look for ways that your faith would be ignited. Amen. Are you with me? Okay. I don't know what you are believing for, what you have faith for when you come to church on Sunday, when you meet with fellow believers, but I want you to know it's not a matter of hope. Hope doesn't take any effort. Hope is just a thought like, oh, well, I hope so. You know, driving down the street and you're like, I kind of want a coffee. Well, I wonder if they're open. Well, I hope they are. Let me go check it out. Right. It's just, uh, it might be. But when you have faith, you say, you know what? I believe my deliverance is coming. I have faith that I have breakthrough coming into my life. Amen. Come on, put it together for the Lord. As you prepare your tithe and your offering, I want you to do something very strategic, and that's to have faith. Put your faith into action and believe for breakthrough in your life. Amen. Now, here's why. I've got a couple of scriptures here I'm going to read. For those of you watching online and in Second Sanctuary, I motivate you as well. I encourage you. Have faith in what you do for the kingdom of God. In Deuteronomy, Old Testament, right? Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 10 and 11. You shall give to him freely without begrudging it. Because of this, the Lord will bless you in all your work and in all you undertake. For the poor will never cease out of the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hands to your brother, to your needy, and to your poor in your land. Get this at the beginning. You shall give to him freely. And because of this, because you give freely and with a cheerful heart, the Lord will bless you in all your work and in all you take on in your life. Amen. How many of you come up with ideas every now and then like, man, this would be an awesome idea, right? We do. We think on this kind of stuff as you are a cheerful giver and in whatever way this may be right now, we're talking about tithes and offerings, but in whatever way you give to the Lord, he will bless your hands. He will bless your work. Amen. Well, Rudy, that's old Testament. That's Old Testament. We don't live by the Old Testament word, so yeah. Keep that in the Old Testament. We live under grace now. Well, 1 Timothy is the New Testament. Amen. So let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 17 through 19. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Come on. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. If you got money and you're not enjoying it, give it to the Lord then. Amen. Come on. This is not prosperity. This is the word of God. This is literally coming out of the Bible. Okay. I'm not twisting it. I'm not turning it around. I'm reading it right out of the scripture. Yeah. I have it on paper because it's a different translation. Why? Because we need to understand. Amen. I could speak up here in Spanish and a lot of you aren't going to understand. So we'd have to have a translator. Amen. 
Well, King James Version, thus saith the Lord, thou shall, and this and that and the other. Kind of hard to understand, but this is pretty plain, guys. Right? Who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. Oh, that was close. I was going to add to it. The Bible says not to add to it. But I will say this as a side note from myself. What we're doing here at Hungry Gen is a good deed. What we do here at Hungry Gen is for a good cause. Amen? We are not sowing into different communities, the alphabet community, this, that, and the other community. We're sowing into future pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets of the Word of God. Amen? We're building and constructing a house for the Lord, a house that would be called a house of prayer. Amen? So put your money into something good. Amen? If you, if you have questions, ask, well, where's that money going? You just saw a major project that's being undertaken right now at Hungry Gen. Amen? Come on. I'm not going to take too much longer. Let me just finish the scripture. So use your money for good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. Again, by doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for future so that they may experience true life. Come on. Like I said, let's keep it up, okay? Glory to glory. Don't, 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 don't let it take a nosedive because we're into this area, okay? Be a cheerful giver. So right now, there's plenty of ways you can give. Those watching our online, you can participate as well, and you can be a kingdom investor today, amen? And you can take part in what Hungry Gen is doing because I'm telling you, when our youth group is thousands locally and millions globally, you guys are going to say, I was a part of that. Yeah, I'm 60, 70, 80 years old, but you know what? I sowed into them, and there is my fruit. Amen? Come on, somebody. There we go. You can text any amount to 84321, hungrygen.com slash give. You can give through Venmo, Cash App, PayPal, and the awesome way to do it, which is through your envelopes. They are going to pass those buckets once you're ready. As you prepare, we're going to pray. Father, I just pray right now that you would open the floodgates of heaven, Lord, that you would begin to pour out your blessings on their life, on their marriages, on their finances, Father God, on their health in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I just pray breakthrough in their lives right now. In Amen. Go ahead and fix your eyes on the screen. Hello, this is David Diga Hernandez, and I want to invite you to be a part of this small group study, a six-week course Praying in the Holy Spirit. In this course, we cover praying in the Holy Spirit or praying from union with the person of the Holy Spirit. What is speaking in tongues? What happens when you pray in tongues? The three expressions of the gift of tongues, as well as eight myths about speaking in tongues where we deal with cessationism. I'll also be praying with you that the gift of tongues might be activated in your life. So if this has been a point of frustration for you, or if you just want greater understanding on the gift, then make sure that you're a part of this study. It's going to be an exciting six weeks. Make sure to join us. Hallelujah. Can we put our hands together for life groups? How many of us are in a life group? So all the rest of you with your hands down, it's for you. Life groups are our source of community here at the church. The Bible says we should dwell with the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And while it's so important to take the main thing of our relationship being with God, with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, we cannot discount the importance of believing brothers and sisters around us. Amen? So make sure you take the advantage of the uh, QR code, scan that, and you can select which group meets at the time and the date and the type that's ready for you. If you want mar for married couples, it's there. Guys only, girls only, everything is available. Just click it and get involved, get connected today, and it shall be a blessing in Jesus' name. Right now, it's time for testimony, and we want to glorify God for what He's done in our lives and what we believe through her testimony and through the word you receive today. God is about to do it again and again and again in your life. Please put your hands together as we welcome her to the stage. Welcome in Jesus' name. Please tell us your name and where you're from. My name is Nicole Hilker, and I am born and raised in Tri-Cities. 
Hallelujah. So share with us about your testimony. Tell us how bad did the darkness get before Jesus, the light of the world, came on the scene? So growing up, childhood, my childhood was pretty rough. Uh, rough. I, well, I had an amazing father, sacrificed a lot for me. My mother was quite the opposite. She was very much, you know, into drugs and I was uh, mentally and physically abused. So it all kind of started then. The depression started really bad at a young age. Um, that led into school with me skipping school, which led into me starting drugs at just 11 years old. Um, and then that led to me dropping out of school and it led to me even selling drugs. Um, so just started spiraling while that was happening. I also did end up getting sexually assaulted during that a few times. So I'm, you know, I'm spiraling at that point. I'm into drugs really deep, selling drugs in really deep, just doing a lot of things I shouldn't be doing. Um, fast forward to November, 2023, um, still there, you know, didn't graduate, not working, just completely lost, have no idea what I'm doing. I had had a seizure right before Thanksgiving due to alcohol. Um, and that's when I was like, okay, I need to do something. So I prayed for the first time in a long time. And now I didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> but I was like, I'm going to pray. And I, you know, I asked, I was like, I'm so lost. I, I need your help. And at the end of that month, um, someone I didn't really know at the time, they reached out and they're talking about how they go to church and they're like, we would love to have you. And I'm like, this is a sign. This is a sign. You know, I just asked, I just prayed like, this is a sign I need to take it. So I did. And, you know, growing up, my family is Catholic. So having to, you know, I got tattoos to, you know, sit here filling voids. Every time I was depressed, I'm like, I'm going to get a tattoo. So very talked down along, you know, family wise with God's not going to love you because of this and that. So my perception wasn't that good. So I was very nervous to go in the church, but this church, it was out of town. Um, they welcomed me with open arms, you know, no questions, no judgment, nothing. And I was like, wow, like, this is, this is true. And so I was like, you know what? I need to take it further. Can we put our hands together for the love of God right there? So just before you take the next step, I want you to tell us a bit. The depression was one thing. The drugs was one thing. But tell us more about the thoughts and the negative thoughts about yourself that it also gave you. Um, so it did get so bad, the negative thoughts, like it got to the point where I didn't want to be here. And I did attempt to try and take my own life a couple times, which by the grace of God did not work. Um, so it, you know, it, it got down that bad and, um, I never felt so worse about myself. I felt like I didn't have a purpose. I felt like I didn't know what to do. Um, all that. So when I was able to feel, you know, once I start, once I started going to church, I was like, hey, I want to take this further. I can feel the release of that depression, the anxiety, all of it. I feel it starting to slowly release. And so I was like, man, this, this is amazing. So then, you know, the weather's bad. Couldn't drive out of town. So I was like, let, let me find a church here. And I'd heard about this church. And I was like, it's in Pasco. Live in Pasco. It's close. <laughs> let, let me go there. Um, so the day I walk in here, when I tell you, I felt the love of God the moment I walked in this place. <laughs> It doesn't matter how long you've been away from God. The moment you come back to him, he will turn back to you a million times. Can I get an amen? amen. Um, and so, and I'm, I'm sitting down and Pastor Ilya was talking about finding God through depression and, you know, being suicidal. And I'm like, wow, the one day I, I'm coming here, they're, they're speaking. I relate to this. Like, I feel like I'm being spoken to. And then that is the day I decided to come up and fully get saved. And... And ever since then, like that day I walked out, everything was gone. My depression, the overthinking, the anxiety, the PTSD, everything gone. And at 21 years old, I can say I love life again. I'm back in school to get my GED, on my way for a master's degree to work for social work for troubled teens, and I'm working again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is when Jesus takes you from darkness to light and crowns you with his glory. Amen. But it doesn't stop there, does it? Tell us about the goodness of God in your life since then. Um, so first of all, like they're talking about life groups, if you haven't joined one, definitely suggest it. Um, I joined a life group through here and it has been absolutely wonderful just to get that extra advice or help, you know, outside of the church because, you know, it's only, it's only once a week and you need a little bit more of extra. So if you haven't joined one, definitely suggest it. They have been great. Um, but not just that, but I've been able to help other people as well. Like I have a lot of friends that, you know, pretty down and all that. And they're seeing it from me, how I've been, you know, they know what I was doing and they see me now just 
living life, just loving life again. And I'm able to feed that off to my friends and help other people with it. Um, and I'm, I'm just love being able to love life again and have a purpose again and know what I, I'm supposed to be doing. It just has never been better. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Put your hands together. Thank you, Jesus. So tell us about how your friends used to encourage you. And now you're the one strengthening and encouraging them. Tell us about the fire of God you received. Um, so, you know, I mean, basic with my friends, I just be like, you're good. You got it. <laughs> and now that, you know, I felt like before I was a follower, I felt like the whole like corniness of, of um, it being, oh, God's so good. But now I feel like I'm over here to my friends. I'm like, God is good. He is there. He is listening. Like, and <laughs> so now I feel like I'm one of those people out there like that, but I'm very grateful for it. I'm very grateful to be able to show from experiences, you know, people I've grown up with and show them like, this is true. Like I felt it for myself. You know, we're not just out here talking like it is real. And I have felt it. I'm a walking, breathing testimony. <laughs> Hallelujah. And lastly, what is your word of advice? Maybe to someone who has had an experience of God as you had, but never came back and on fire with him. What is your word for them? You know, there's a lot of things we don't know why this or that's happening. We don't know why this was taken out of our life. We don't know why we got this job, why we didn't get this job, or maybe we didn't get the car we wanted, or why this person was taken out of our life. You know, we, we don't know the reason all the time, but what we do know is God has already made that bigger picture that we may not be able to see at the time, and we may not know the reason for it, but he will give us the reason for it when the time is right. So just trust in his time, because his time is right, and it is perfect, and it will be okay. He is right there with you. Amen. Let's put our hands together for Jesus one more time. Thank you so much for your testimony. And guys, you can see the QR code we have in a moment for testimonies. As she has shared her testimony, I know it's touched your heart. I know it's caused your faith to light up. And people in Second Sanctuary and all over the world, you have an opportunity too to share your testimony and impact someone's lives. Let them know God is good. Let the world know our God is a miracle working God and he still answers prayer today. Amen. Without any further ado, please welcome Pastor Vlad. Amazing job. Amen. Weren't you blessed by this testimony? You know, when you come to Hungry Jen, uh, it's not a TV show episode. It's a full-blown Marvel movie. <laughs> you know, that's why it's worth getting stuck in that traffic over there. It's worth all the fights you, with, you have with your children, with your spouse on the way here. Um, we don't do drive through it's a, it's a full-blown filet mignon. Come on, somebody. And so from worship to um, the powerful testimonies, and we experience that every single week where people uh, share their stories because stories, they connect. And they, they, we, we don't just want to read about what God is doing. We want to hear about what God is doing in our midst. Amen. Amen. Before I welcome our guests, I just want to uh, highlight something, and that is how to get involved. For those of you who are brand new to our church community, maybe you've been coming to Hungry Gen for some time. There's a few things uh, that I just want to highlight. One of them, if you've never been water baptized, and water baptism is, is, is something that we publicly declare that we follow Jesus. Um, we have the opportunity on the Easter service where we're going to have our water baptism. Secondly, if you've been coming and you're saying, hey, I want to get involved, I want to serve, I want to become part of the team, I want to become part of the family, tomorrow night actually at 6.30, somebody say tomorrow at 6.30 p.m., <laughs> very important. Um, we have what we call the welcome night. It's about one hour where you come, you hear about the vision, you, get a, um, you hear about how to get involved, and you become part of a local community. We're not a perfect church, uh, but, but this could be your church. <laughs> Amen and stuff. So um, we are a growing church and we are a bunch of sinners who are saved by Jesus and are trying to live our life without killing each other and loving Jesus and uh, pleasing Him. Amen. We're multicultural. We are a little bit loud. We see it because you see, it. you see a combination of Hispanics, white, black, young and old. You put all of us together, you put a lot of crazy together like... You're going to have an explosion somewhere like, man, this is just kind of weird. You know, it's not, it's not like my grandma's church, but your grandma is also welcome here. And so, yeah, we, and the other part is we got a lot of people here who are from a life that they didn't know the Lord. 
So you bring some of that ex-gangster stuff, you know, into the church. You bring some of that, you know, ghetto stuff. You bring some of that, like, crazy stuff. And some of the crazy, the Lord delivers from the sin, but He didn't deliver the, all, all of us from the crazy. So that's why you see us, you know, sometimes jumping, yelling, and all of this stuff. And so, because we, we don't want God to take away the passion. We want to use that passion to love Jesus. Amen. And we're not ashamed of Jesus. And, uh, and so that's, that's pretty much it. We have come to an end of our marriage conference. Um, this was our pretty much official first uh, marriage conference that we've done at Hungry Gen, and it was incredible. Uh, how many of you, uh, you enjoyed last two days uh, at the marriage conference? In our second sanctuary, wave at me. Those of you online, it's been incredible from Friday night and as well as yesterday morning, yesterday afternoon, and yesterday evening. Uh, the vows that were renewed and just, just incredible. And today we have the opportunity and the privilege to also be a part, a little bit of the marriage conference and to hear from our wonderful guests. The reason why I'm so excited for this morning's message is this. I do believe we are going to kill a lot of sacred cows and a lot of lies and myths that really create despair and hopelessness in marriage. I always grew up around um, married people without seeing divorce. Four generations, my, my grandma, she comes in the first service, 16 children. Um, you know, one man, so in one man, that's, that's a miracle. 16 kids is not the miracle, it's the fact that one marriage. And my grandpa already went to be with the Lord. He's like, I can't take this anymore. I'm done. But my grandma's still kicking alive and happy and serving Jesus. And um, so I've seen in my parents, I'm the oldest of five. I've seen in my pastor's life, um, you know, um, where the, the marriage is. So I'm surrounded by that. So I have an optimistic, positive view that marriages work. Divorce is non-existent. But I am surrounded today by the culture. And the culture teaches other things. And when I was a younger person... A teenager, I came across this, uh, these books and, um, and I was a teenager like last year, okay, so this one didn't happen like 20 years ago, okay, so I'm still very young. And so um, I started to prepare for marriage at 16. I started to prepare for marriage financially at 17 because I wanted to get married at 19. You know, so like I'm going to get ready for this. So one of the first things I started to do is I started to read a lot of books and listen to podcasts. And so one of the books that I've read is actually for him and for her because, you know, I have two sisters, two brothers and, you know, and my sisters are a little bit crazy. I was like, I want to understand the woman that I'm going to marry. And, you know, my sisters are not a good example because they're just weird. The woman I marry is going to be amazing, you know, and reading the book, I realized my sisters, my mom, all of these women, they seem to be all kind of similar. And uh, it was a very enlightening, enlightening book. Recently, which was last year, I uh, read the book on uh, the secrets of happy, highly happy marriages and read other books about um, debunking the statistics. And I mean, my eyes were like, oh. in fact, I had a whole sermon prepared last year based on your research. I didn't preach it though. I was supposed to give you credit every single two minutes. And, uh, and I was like, you know what, I think this is going to be way too much giving credit. I'm just going to try to see if we can invite them so that they can do that message. <laughs> so it's been one year in the making. And I actually uh, DM'd uh, Shanti on Instagram and said, hey, I just want to let you know this was really powerful. But it really, it gave me hope, not for my marriage, but it gave me hope for the institution of marriage. As a young leader, as a young person who's been married only for 13 years and also... I wanted you to hear today, not just because you guys know me, I yell, scream, shout and get you all, uh, uh, get all worked up and then that is good. But today uh, what you're going to hear, I believe, is going to debunk myth. It's also going to give you inspiration. It's going to give you instruction and it's going to give you tools and hope because we're people of truth. We're not people of myths, trends and lies. We're people of truth. And the things they're going to share, because I was watching the first service, even though I knew very much the information I was watching, that it was so refreshing again. And I believe you're going to be blessed today like never before. So as Hungry Gen, we're just, we honor and we appreciate the ministry and the work that both Jeff and Shanti are doing for the body of Jesus and for the marriages around the world. Would you help me to welcome Jeff and Shanti as they share the word with us today. Thank you. 
I didn't actually know that backstory. That's really awesome. Wow. You know, <laughs> in between um, services, Shanti... Is it working? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Shanti leaned over to me and she said, this would be our church. Totally. <laughs> If, if we, we lived, lived in here, this area, this would totally be our church. I, I got saved in a full gospel Pentecostal church. She got saved <laughs> on a Catholic retreat. And then we met in graduate school. And the very first, she came to the Christian fellowship group in graduate school. And I was the uh, leader, the leader of it. And she walked in, and we were having our worship time. And, and we should explain that the Christian Fellowship at Harvard is very um, multicultural. Very multicultural. All over the world. People from all over the world. And, but she kept, re- she kept thinking, why are all these people raising their hands? Are they asking questions? I've and no one's answering. <laughs> so she got into the stream, too. Definitely. Thank you for that introduction. That is, we are people of the truth and seeking, you know, what the word says, what is true as far as evidence that we see, that's what we should be basing our actions on instead of what is written that may not be written by people who are also pursuing truth. Um, So... Let's, uh, let's just start with we should introduce a little bit about a ourselves. Bit so so for about 20 years now, we have embarked. I'm a lawyer by training. Shanti was an analyst on Wall Street. Um, and about 20 years ago, we kind of stumbled on to this idea of, can we research why men and women kind of don't understand each other? And what can we kind Nobody of... Nobody knows what you're talking yeah, about. <laughs> what, what can we kind of add to the conversation? So for the last 20 years, we've been doing these nationally representative research studies. And that's been kind of our gig. Here. To help people People thrive. understand yep. one another. Yep. And so we're going to actually, we're going to review a scripture that for those of you who are familiar with the Bible, you've probably heard this. Some of you may never have really read this before. If you have a Bible, if you have your Bible app, let's open the word to Genesis 2 right back at the very beginning. And we are going to watch our God create the institution of marriage, okay? We're going to be talking, as Pastor Vlad said, we are going to be talking today, whether you're married, whether you're not, whether you were married, you're not anymore, whether you're hoping to be married, whatever you think, hopefully this will encourage you. But we need to start at the beginning, okay? We need to watch what God does here. So start in Genesis 2, we're going to start with verse 18, and then we're going to skip to verse 21. Then the Lord, so I need to say, by the way, just to set it up for those of you who aren't as quite, quite as familiar, as God was creating the world and he was creating the sky and the animals and night and day, and he was creating these things and he kept saying, it was good, it was good, it was good. And then we come to this curious verse, verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is, ju- who is just right for him. And then skip to verse 21. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. At last, the man <laughs> exclaimed, This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. Our former pastor said this was essentially Adam going hubba hubba, right? Like that's what that means. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. 
And so what, this is the institute creation of the institution and the exactly, covenant of marriage. Because God values marriage. I mean, from the very beginning, he brought a husband and a wife together, desiring for them to experience oneness. And beyond that, I mean, if we move forward a few thousand years into the New Testament, we have Paul saying that this institution of marriage is a reflection of Christ and the church, that relationship. So today we are going to be covering three points about this covenant, about this institution that God created for our good and for his glory, right? We're going to be looking at three really important points. And I would honestly suggest Take some notes in your phone. Write down a couple of the things we're talking about. Because I can guarantee if you're anything like Pastor Vlad or anything like us, when you start hearing some of the truth, you're going to be like, I want to capture this. I don't want to forget it. Okay? So the three points that we're going to be covering today, we're going to be talking about the big picture hope for marriage, for this institution that God has created. And then second, the actual truth about the state of marriages today, because I can guarantee that for many of us, it's different than what we think, okay? And then the third, we're going to cover just a couple practical things that we can do, sort um, of ways that God has designed marriage to A little marriage to taste thrive. of what we did yesterday. Correct. A little conference. kind similar to a, a couple taste. of things that we talked about yesterday. So, yeah. I- I don't know about you all, but I, I love stories. I love hearing people's stories. We, we sat with Mariana and Ilya, Ilya you know, yesterday, yesterday oh, and he what an told us the story. story of the church. And it's fascinating. It's hope-filled. It's inspiring. So let's, I want to start this by telling you a little story. When our daughter was in um, elementary school and, and uh, middle school, she had a best friend, best friend named Meredith. Meredith was the daughter of a woman named Ellen. Ellen was a single mom with three kids that she was responsible for raising. And as part of our two kids being friends, Shanti reached out to Ellen and became someone that they could talk together and they became close friends over those couple of years. Ellen wanted to be remarried and eventually met a wonderful godly man and you know, they were moving toward marriage. And she confessed to Shanti. She said, look, I am not naive. I see what's happening in the culture. I know the state of marriage. I know the statistics. I know the significantly high failure rate that second marriages have based on just the research or the data that's out there. So I'm going to enter into this. We're going to get married, but I think it's just wise for me to kind of keep a second bank account on the side so that if he does flake out, even though he's a good man, it appears right now, I'm going to protect my kids. I'm going to protect myself. And what do you think about that, Shanti? And we'll tell you what we think about that in just a minute. (laughs) Because... What she was doing is when it comes to marriages, when it comes to really any relationship, anything that we're doing in our lives, but we're talking specifically about this covenant of marriage, we take action based on what we think is true. Let me say that again. We take actions based on what we think is true, but What if what we're thinking is not true? We're going to take the wrong action. And when it comes to marriages, our entire culture today is filled with all of this concern and all this negativity and all of this discouraging stuff. Everybody here has heard this kind of stuff. We hear, for example, Marriages are in trouble. We hear things are falling apart. I guarantee you've read a news article or something somewhere that says, well, you know, in an era when divorce rates are rising, right? Like you hear those kinds of things. 
You hear people writing about a 50% divorce rate. Who here has heard the conventional wisdom that 50% of marriages end in divorce? Seriously, raise your hand. And okay, I'm going to so ask another many question. Many people, yeah. How many have shared that information with others? I know we I sure have. did. We sure did. Yeah, and we hear also he we here has heard that the rate of divorce is the same in the church. Raise your hand, seriously, if no you've difference. heard that. Okay, no, no difference. difference. And we hear <laughs> we hear something else. We hear marriage is just complicated. Right, like it takes a PhD in psychotherapy and a minor in mind reading, right, <laughs> to, to like manage to manage marriage, and we take actions based on all those beliefs that we think are true, and so our friend Ellen, it was perfectly logical in air quotes, logical in her mind, when you think that you are going into a marriage with a wonderful Christian man, but you know, 60, 70% of remarriages end in divorce, she thought. And so for her, she thinks, you know, I need to create a bank account on the side because statistically, I need to be able to protect my kids because the chances aren't really that good. Or maybe you're a single and you've been really kind of standing back and wondering whether marriage is a good idea or not. And so you're in a relationship now and you think, well, maybe we're going to move towards marriage, but I'm going to keep a part of my heart kind of closed off, right? I'm not going to be completely all in because I need to protect myself emotionally. And what our friend Ellen, what I told her that day, and what a single in that situation might be doing, what you're doing with those things because of what you believe to be true, you're creating a wall, And you are, as you're building that wall, you are creating a lack of trust and you're going to cause the problem that you're trying to protect yourself from, okay? We so often do that because we are acting out of fear. And it turns out that one of the reasons this is so tragic the enemy has so gotten in there with these beliefs that we, we share about this institution that God created. We are so sure that there's all this negative news. And here's the reality. Almost all of those things that I mentioned, so much of that, it's news. It's not truth. It's news. But it is not truth. Do, now, by the way, before we go, because we're going to share some encouraging things, don't get me wrong. Don't hear me saying that there aren't marriage challenges. Of course there are, right? And if you're dealing with issues in your marriage, I mean, it can be, it can be, it can all, it can be hard work. It, can, it needs some, sometimes a lot of effort. But the truth, I'm not minimizing that, but the truth is God wants amazing things for his children. God has good gifts for his children. And, and, and the other point also that we, we try to always share is that, look, if you've gone that route where divorce was Yeah, the was option, your reality. Absolutely. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah. So you know. But what we want you to do is to be filled with the right information. Yeah, the truth. Going forward, the truth. So... We've been doing these research studies, as I said, for about 20 years now. And if one were to kind of boil down everything that we've kind of been learning, there are lots of factors that go into having marriage issues. But as far as the, what really kind of shapes the outcome of these um, points in our marriages, in our lives, is whether or not the couple has a sense of hope in their marriage. If you have a sense of hope, you can kind of get through anything. Without hope, though, if it's replaced with futility, if the sense is, it's never going to work, it's just always going to keep going down, that's kind of the way it works with us as humans. So yeah. what can we do? Because... To- we Talk have to re- we have to replace that sense of futility with truth because here's what happens i'm just going to kind of call it out if 
if, if you have a sense, like you've been hopeful and then things get hard, things get hard. You think most marriages end in divorce. You think we're probably not going to make it. Here is when it starts to become really toxic. It's when you start to think, you know what? The ship is going to sink anyway. Because once you start to think the ship is going to sink anyway, then you start thinking, and this is where the enemy starts, I would say whispering, but it's actually shouting. <laughs> this is where the enemy starts saying, if the ship is going to sink anyway, why bother working so hard to bail it out? Right? Like it's better to use all that energy to escape the wreck intact, right? And yet it is based on this lie, this conventional wisdom that marriages are in trouble and that we have, the problem is we have a culture-wide feeling of futility about marriage. And so we are going to share you with you some really good news truth because we want you to be ambassadors for the truth and to be able to encourage those who the enemy is trying to destine for destruction. So let's replace that false narrative that we've heard and replace it with hope and start by debunking some of these myths. Great. So Shanti had, um, she's written a book. She wrote it how how many years ago? It's about Uh, almost almost 10. 10. Almost 10 years. So I'll let you give the background of it. But this particular book um, was based on, you know, what are those things that we think we know about marriage that may not actually be true. So what are some of those myths? So the book is called The Good News About Marriage, and it's about the one debunking you were about, I think, the yeah. five myths that have discouraging impact on our lives and what we think about marriage. And, um, you know, how you, why don't we, let me just say that it was complicated, <laughs> really complicated. It was, really complicated. It, was, it was heavy lifting as far as statistical analysis. So I was no help to her in that. I went to law school, so I didn't have to do math. <laughs> she was an f- analyst on Wall Street. Math was kind of something she did. She loves statistics and figuring things out. I'm a numbers out. nerd. I That's can't help it. That's what she is. So as we talk about this, what we're going to do is I'm going to act as kind of the tour guide for you all. And I'm going to ask you like I'm interviewing her on some of these things. And she's going to answer and I won't have to talk numbers. <laughs> so how did this kind of come about? So the way that I started into this was I was actually a newspaper columnist a number of years ago. You guys remember newspapers, you know, those things that were printed on paper. Like, remember that back in the day? Yeah. The people here who are under 30 are like, no, (laughs) no, don't remember that. But we had, I was a syndicated columnist. We had, um, our column was in 90, 95 papers around the country. And I was doing a column one day on divorce and talking about divorce. And I thought, you know, we had been doing relationship research for um, years at this point. And I wanted to correctly cite the divorce rate, you know, because everybody knows it's about 50%. um, But, you know, maybe it's not actually 50. You know, maybe it's 48.7, right? Like, I wanted to actually cite it. So I went to the Census Bureau, and the CDC has, like, a Bureau of Vital Statistics. And there's all these different sort of government entities where you can find all sorts of numbers if you're a columnist and you want accurate data. And as I'm looking through all of these charts and graphs and numbers, I'm like, wait a minute, (laughs) because none of this matches the narrative. Like none of this shows me anything close to a 50% divorce, like not even in the same ballpark. And I started to think, because we had been doing all these research interviews and talking to average people for years and seeing this sense of futility itself can kill a marriage, I started to go, whoa, like, if this isn't true, this is a really big deal. And isn't that just like our enemy? Mm. To tell a lie and to tell it so well that even the people of God believe it and help spread it. Yes. 
And so this is, <laughs> when, we, when I share this, these, the data in secular context, I don't say this part, um, but I'll tell you guys, this, as I started diving into this, not only was this incredibly complicated, but I felt like the Holy Spirit wouldn't let me stop. Like, keep going, keep digging, keep investigating. And I realized eventually it took me eight years to figure this out. It was so complicated. And I realized, you know what? The average pastor, when he's looking, he doesn't have years to spend trying to figure out the truth. You know, he has 20 or 30 minutes in, you know, research as he's preparing for a sermon. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was like, this is so crucial for the people of God to be able to be people of truth in this area. So we're going to talk about five myths. Yes. We're going to probably not touch on all of them. Two or really three. Have the time. Two or three. Okay. So okay. Let's, let's start with the big one. What okay. is the actual divorce rate? Okay. Can you go somewhere and look and they've got a line item that says no. divorce rate? No. That's one of the reasons why this is so complicated. No one knows exactly what the divorce rate is in part because it completely depends on how you define the divorce rate. Is it the percentage of people who are going to get divorced eventually? Is it the percentage of people in any room who have been divorced? Is it the people who, um, you know, of a certain age bracket, if you look at from this age to this age, are divorced within a certain period of time? Is it the men's version of any of those things or the women's version? Because believe it or not, men and women have different divorce rates. Anyway, <laughs> I know, it's all very complicated. And, and so... When, we, when I started looking for what is, the, to me, the best way of explaining a logical divorce rate, one of the best numbers that I saw, because could, I could quote 20 things to you, but one of the best that I saw, which is a good conservative kind of in the middle number, is this one. Um, as, and this is as of 10 years ago when the book came out. By the way, I'm going to tell you this but you need to know the numbers have improved since the book came out, okay? So right now, 71% of people are still married to their first spouse. Let me say that again, 71%. 71% of people are still married to their first spouse. And here's the amazing thing, the 29% who aren't still married to their first spouse, that includes everyone who was married for 50 years and their spouse died. That's just marriages that have ended. That's not the divorce rate. That includes death and divorce. Now, this is an example of we don't know what the exact divorce rate actually is, so we have to estimate. This is a perfect example of why it's complicated. But there's about a 14% rate of widowhood. We know it has to be 29% or less, you know, but we don't know exactly what it is. You can, once you look at the rate of widowhood and you look at some other factors, you can kind of squint sideways and say that maybe there's about a 25% divorce rate for first marriages. And now, don't get me wrong, that is still too high, okay? But it is a universe different from this flip the coin idea of 50%. And what this means, remember how I said you take action based on what you believe to be true? This means that if you have a friend who is going through a really rough time in their marriage, you can come alongside them, put your arm around them, and say with total truthful confidence, you are gonna make it, most people do. Totally different message. Yes. Okay, so it's not flip the coin. Yes. Why did we ever start thinking that it was 50%? Yeah, 50%. So here is the, there, is, there are two main reasons why we think it's so bad, okay? The first one is statistical, which is in 1972, you know how um, no-fault divorce started? You know, it used to be back in the day you had to convince a judge that there was a reason to get divorced, So in 1972, no-fault divorce started, and you could get divorced just because you wanted to, right? You didn't have to convince a judge. And so at at the moment, the divorce rate started just skyrocketing. 
And because the, there were people because, in really unhappy Because people marriages. were just racing. To, suddenly they could get divorced because they wanted to. And so all of a sudden, like this, and it hit a peak pretty quickly in 1980. But in that time, in 1972, the demographers of the day said, oh my gosh, if this spike keeps up, we're going to hit 50% someday. But in 1980, it hit a peak and it, because people saw what damage it caused to rush to divorce so quickly. And it has come down dramatically since then. And it has been falling ever since. If you ever hear someone say the divorce rate is rising, stop them immediately. No, it has been falling every, almost every year since 1980. And it's fallen something like 30 or 40%. I would have to look so, at the numbers. So th- what the, there are certain oh. segments of the population yes. where that rate may be true. Correct. And so here's the key. This, when you see a professor so-and-so at university such-and-such, and, and, you know, you see an article about a, you know, he projects a 47% divorce rate, okay? Because some people are still projecting these high numbers. Mentally, take a giant red pen and circle the word projects, Okay? Those are always projections. We have never come close to hitting that number for society as a whole. Now, as Jeff said, there are some high-risk groups that have hit that number. Like people who get married as teenagers, for example, are much, have a higher divorce rate in the first few years. And so, but that's a tiny percent of the population. For the society as a whole, we've never gotten close. Okay, so that's the first, I said there were two reasons we believe this. The first is that people still are projecting these high numbers sometimes, which I think is crazy because we've never gotten close. But anyway, the second reason is it's a structural problem with our sort of culture around news and information, which is that unfortunately, bad news gets shared and clicked widely and good news doesn't, okay? And, and it's our fault, right? The news articles wouldn't do clickbait of these bad things if we stopped clicking on them, right? So here is, here is an example of this. So often there will be, this happens all the time, where there will be like a, a big research study and the research study finds, let's just say 10 things, Okay, let's say eight of them are positive, two of them are negative. Guess what the news is going to focus on? Okay, the negative ones. So perfect example, a number of years ago, there was a big article in the New York Times with an above the fold, you know, main um, headline, main headline that said, div- what was it? Divorce is contagious. contagious. Divorce is contagious. And it was the result of a study in this town called Framingham, Massachusetts, where they have followed people and studied people since like the 1940s. And it's been like forever and since they're continue- then. And the study, the study conti- is, is continuing. The study is a longitudinal study. It still continues. And so they know in this particular town, they do know the divorce rate and they know everything about people's you know, health and their following rates their of cancer and their education and pretty much everything. It's a really interesting sort of social study. And so they had done another wave of this study and the New York Times was reporting on it that divorce is contagious, which what that meant, it sounded really negative, but all that that means is that they found in Framingham that if you are surrounded by friends who've been divorced, you are more likely to get divorced. And if you have been surrounded by friends who un- mostly didn't get divorced, you are less likely to get divorced, okay? Because it becomes normal, right? So that's what the article said. So I'm reading <laughs> through the, the article and I come across this finding from the research study of the actual divorce rate in Framingham, Massachusetts since 1940, okay? Like the actual divorce rate. You know what it was? 9.5%. Why is it that the New York Times didn't do this massive piece on representative American city has a 9.5% divorce rate? So we just don't tend to hear 
the very good news about marriage out there. Okay, so... Sorry, I get exercised about this. Can you tell? So that's the first marriages. (laughs) Yes, first marriages. What about the Ellens of the world? The Ellens of the world. Yeah, Ellen, who's our friend, embarking on a second marriage. Yep. I mean, the numbers are pretty (laughs) grim, right, for second marriages? You would think and no. So who here has heard these really high numbers for the remarriages, like 60% divorce rate for second marriages? Seriously, raise your hand. Have you heard these? Some of the people, like 60% divorce rate for second marriages and 72% or something for third marriages, like really grim. So my senior researcher and I, Tally Whitehead, we wanted to see how that, the study or studies that came up with those numbers we wanted to see how they got them because sometimes it's about the methodology. And, you know, so we basically spent three years trying to track down those numbers. And every news article that mentioned them, we looked at the citation and then we looked at the citation of that citation and that citation. Like we basically tried to, to follow them back to the source. Every news article, every magazine, every website, And they all trace back to one of three sources that don't exist. It's a pure urban legend. And here's my favorite one. There is a um, Psychology Today article that you will see quoted when people are talking about the remarriage divorce rate. And it quotes a Dr. Jennifer Baker, who is a very well-respected researcher at a group in Missouri called the Forest Institute. And it says Dr. Jennifer Baker found a 50%, 60%, 72% divorce rate for first, second, third divorce rates. So of course we emailed Dr. Baker to say, can we see your study? Because I just wanted to see what her methodology was. This is my favorite one. She emails us back all in capital letters. And it's the email back says, that's not me. I've never said that. I've been trying to get them to take my name off that website for years. It's truly just an urban legend. And so, and there were several of those where literally what people are citing, it doesn't exist. One of the common ones was a Census Bureau table that does exist. Like the Census Bureau table, such and such number, 1237 whatever it is, it, it's there, like there is one, but when you go to 123.7 and you look at it, you go, I don't see anything on here about remarriage divorce rates. Like sometimes, you know, maybe it's buried and you have to multiply numbers. So I called the census Shanti was on a first name basis with the people at the <laughs> census. Was. So she'd call I and they'd was. say, hey, Shanti. She'd say, hey, Rose. <laughs> um, got Just, a question on, on, on table 127.3. Yeah. So Rose got another one for you. And so I said, I'm not seeing this. She's like, oh, yeah, we've heard that too. We've never said that. We didn't find that. That's not in that table. Wow. Is the enemy not so frustrating? And we have to know this stuff so we can counteract it. Can I? And, and that was important. Oh, wait. I got to tell her the good news yes. about this. Go ahead. Is that okay? I, I, I was going to get to Ellen. Okay. Because this, you know, this was Ellen. Okay. So, so you guys are going, okay, if it's not that, what is it? Well, here's the good news. Just like 71% of people are still married to their first spouse, 65% of people are still married to their second spouse. And here's the thing, the 35% who aren't, remember, that's death and divorce. These people are getting married at older ages. There is a high likelihood that a much higher percentage of that is death instead of divorce. It is possible that remarriages have a lower divorce rate than first marriages. No one knows, but that is statistically very possible. And and that news was liberating for Ellen, who then changed her actions. Her plan. Her plan of uh, keeping that separate bank account. And they've been married 15 years now? 15 years now. Happily. Happily. Um, let Let me bust on us believers, though, just a little bit, because we should be people of truth. I have heard this statistic also that Shanti debunked or was not able to confirm. Oh. Maybe you've heard it. 
I've heard pastors say this, and Sorry, maybe we're gonna, I even said it. We're probably gonna. Yeah, maybe we're gonna make some people unhappy. Are you okay? Which this is was, truth. You guys need was, to know. Here was the. Here was the. Here's the phrase: that a couple that prays together, those of those couples that pray together regularly, one in ten thousand get divorced. So. If you do that, your chances of getting divorced are very, very small. And we believe that. We believe however, that that is a powerful fact of that couples should pray together. However, no one has ever actually found that. That's another urban legend. However, <laughs> the, the good news It, it apparently is, came from Dr. Phil. I mean, how's yes. that working for you? <laughs> So, it did. It, it, Dr. Phil <laughs> was quoting, because, I mean, they spent years oh, trying to dig this out. Oh. And apparently, there was a guy that Dr. Phil quoted who said it at some sort of... It was a... It was, it was on a, a video... A no, cassette, it was a cassette, cassette tape, tape series from the 1980s. From the 1980s. And, and Dr. Phil quoted it, and so literally my poor senior researcher, Tally, she found an old-fashioned tape recorder, <laughs> and she ordered the cassette series, <laughs> and she listened to all 10 hours of this cassette series, and never once did he actually say that. So that was an urban legend. But the good news, the, the good news is... That praying together works. Well, and here's, here's why we can say this. This concept of... The rate of divorce is the same in the church, okay? Here's the truth about that. That is absolutely the first thing from the truth. It's the reverse. Here is why we think that. Everyone thinks that George Barna, who is a very respected researcher, respected research group, everyone thinks George Barna found that, and he didn't because he wasn't studying people in the church he, in this particular study that has been misunderstood and misquoted and discouraged so many pastors over the years, what he was studying was actually just belief systems, mental belief systems. So when you call people on the phone and people I, I self-identify as a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew or non-religious or an atheist, those people had the same divorce rates. But he specifically excluded whether they went to church from the analysis because that wasn't what he was trying to study. And so I partnered with Barna and we bought that data set. Which and, they had collected when they were talking to yes, the people on yes, the phone. Well, they, all sorts of demographic information. Correct. And one of the things that they had asked them was, was were you in church last week? Okay. And so we re-ran all the numbers with that factor added back in. And here's the astounding news. According to both the Barna data, the same data, and every other study that's ever been done on this, for people who actually attend church regularly, the divorce rate plummets. And that it falls anywhere from, depending on the study, 25 to 50% or more. There was a Harvard study just a couple of years ago that found that churchgoers, their divorce rate dropped 58%. The reality is doing what God says, getting in church, not getting into the habit of out of meeting with one another, and being and hearing the word of God, trying to be with others and listen to the Holy Spirit, being in small group, like our testimony was just saying, being in community with others, God tells us to do this, mostly for our relationship with him, but also because he knows it's protective of our relationships with one another, and especially for our marriage. Because if you get into a small group, if you end up having issues in your life, and maybe at some point you have issues in your marriage, someone's going to come alongside of you and say, are you and Bob okay? Right? Like, can we pray for you? Or whatever. Come alongside. Encourage. That is the power of the church of community. community that God has created. So kind of in the last 12, 13 minutes here, I'd love to kind of segue 
and the way is kind of the last myth, kind of our my pet peeve. This is totally your pet peeve. Is one hundred percent? Perhaps when you're attending a wedding, and even <laughs> the pastor standing in front of that couple with all of their hopes and dreams of the future. And they're trying to, the pastor tries to bring a little reality to the situation (laughs) and says, we all know that marriage is hard. And I'm thinking, really? Is that like the best advertisement we could come up with for this amazing creation covenant that God has put together saying it's hard to do? And I, to be fair, I I do think that what they're probably trying to say is that marriage can require hard work. It can require selflessness. It can require being tenderhearted toward one another, trying to understand life the way they see it, not just the way I see it or need it to be. But I think what people hear when we say marriage is hard... What people I think here is, oh, marriage is really complicated, right? Like, it's really, like, significantly serious and complex. And that's where that PhD in psychotherapy with a minor in mind reading comes in. And, and the reality is, is that actually, yeah, it does take hard work. But most people enjoy being married and it's not a it, the, it's and, not a grind and this and this is what we spent all our time on yesterday and just we'll talk about briefly is that there are little things that will actually make a pretty big difference in your marriage well let's talk about what we have found at least in this the study that the, we did okay. on the happiest couples so the move book to that you item about. number three yeah. what can we do and okay. And there is what we found, you know, there were about 12 of these different habits that these happy marriages kind of employed in their marriage. That was the book that we were talking about yesterday. And so in that, the uh, one kind of prerequisite for that happiness, that success, was a belief. And that belief is... It turns out that the happy couples... They choose to believe the best of their spouse's intentions towards them, even when they're legitimately hurt. Because it turns out everybody gets hurt, right? Even the happiest couples hurt each other's feelings sometimes. Even as we said yesterday, even the most godly, kind Christian man or woman can be a jerk (laughs) at times. We just are human. It happens. And yet, what we found is that the happiest couples, and by the way, this included, as part of our study group, it included people who had gone from being pretty unhappy, pretty struggling in their marriage, to being part of this, the highly happy couples, the happiest couples. And one of the main things was that they chose to believe the best, even when they were legitimately hurt. Because we all, like I said, we all get hurt. But here's what happens for most of us is when there's that ow, you know, thing, like he, he knew how that would make me feel and he said it anyway. We don't realize that what we're thinking subconsciously, what that translates to is he doesn't care about me, right? That's what that translates to. And it turns out that's not actually true. Statistically, something like 99.26% something something of people really care about their spouse. And so the happiest marriages, they stop that train of thought. This is one of the reasons they got to be so happy. They stop that train of thought and they go, no, mm -mm. no, I know he loves me. I know she appreciates me or whatever. So they must not have known how that would make me feel or they wouldn't have said it. And they replace that with a belief, uh, believing the best of their spouse's intentions. Yeah, the hurt is real, but the intentions are what matter. And and, and again, um, it's often easy to think that, look, marriage is a two-way street. It takes two of us to to really put in the effort. And that's true. You have to be kind of approaching this with a a sense of self-sacrifice and putting and preferring the other's interests. But with this believing the best, 
if you, if just one of you will practice this and begin to do it, it can change one, you, and change your marriage. Um, There was a study done by a professor at the University of Maryland. And in this study, um, he studied these college students in this kind of experiment. And, you know, college students are great because for just a little bit of money, maybe 20 bucks, they'll subject themselves to just about anything. (laughs) And so in this particular study, he had the subject student sitting in a chair. And while they were sitting there, they were kind of hooked up to all these biometric measuring devices, one being like measuring the pulse rate, the... Um, respiration rate, the perspiration rate, the blood pressure, all of those sorts of things. So they were capturing this information from that individual's bodily functions. And they were also hooked up to a cable that ran across the room and disappeared behind a partition. On the other side of the partition was a little machine with a big red button on it. And if the button got pushed, it sent an electric current down through that cable and shocked the person sitting there and caused real discomfort and pain. Now, the, the cool thing was they were told different things, the person sitting there. They were told one of three things about the person on the other side of the partition. In one instance, they were told that the person who's pushing the red button knows that it's going to send a shock to them. But they've also been told that it'll help the student win money. Okay. Like a good intention, right? So in a second instance, they were told that the person hit the button but did it on accident. Didn't mean to do it. And then in a third instance, they were told the person knows that it'll send a shock and they think that's kind of (laughs) cool. So in all three instances, the level of shock was the exact same. But depending on what the person believed about the intentions of the person behind the partition, if they thought they were doing it on purpose for no good reason, it hurt tremendously and registered in all their body's reactions. If they thought they were doing it on accident, it hurt less, even though it was the same amount. And if they thought the person had their best interests at heart, it hurt considerably less. So it was the same shock. All that was different, what was going on inside that person's mind about the intentions of the person. So in our relationships, in our marriage, even though Shanti never does this, but if she were to ever hypothetically say something that hurt my feelings, <laughs> if I can never, I never do this, that she cares for me, she didn't intend for that to hurt the way it did, it hurts less. Yeah, we, this is one of those areas, guys, if you will just practice just this one, like it really truly can have this outsized impact, like a little thing that really does make okay, a big so difference. Okay, so we've got a second one. We got a second the one. The second we one, gotta, yeah. uh, many of you have probably heard this kind of um, wise statement. And we didn't, this in, is one we didn't cover yeah, yesterday. In, in a relationship, never keep score. Just don't do that. Don't go there. It'll end poorly if you keep score. What we found from the happiest couples is guess what? They kept score. What does that mean? (laughs) But they kept score completely differently. Because yeah, 1 Corinthians 13, keep no record of wrongs. Yeah, keeping score of what the other person isn't doing for you or how much they're being obnoxious or whatever, that is going to be damaging. And yet what we found that the happiest couples did, again, including the people that moved into being in that happiest category, they kept score of what their spouse is giving And they, it like changed their outlook because once you start like looking for it, you're going to see it everywhere. There is a neuroscientific principle. I want you guys to write this down. And this is biblical and it is neuroscience. What you focus on is what you will see. And this is powerful for keeping track of what the other person is giving because suddenly you start seeing it everywhere and there's so much gratitude that rises up. It's kind of like, you know, that, that, that um, situation that happens when you buy a new car and maybe it's <laughs> yellow. You like yellow. 
But before you bought that yellow car, you never saw any other yellow cars on the road. But the moment you own a yellow car, there are yellow cars everywhere. And it's, it's crazy. So here's, I, I love this one story that this pastor shared with us when we were kind of doing an interview on this particular topic. And he said, can I just share a story? What just happened last month with my wife and I? And Chauncey's like, yeah, great. He said, look, he said, my wife is a registered nurse. And one day she was doing her 12 hour shift. And I got in my mind that I, was going to win husband of the year. So we had four little kids. Four little, little kids. Children. So he said, I did all the laundry for the whole week. I did the, you know, I vacuumed the entire house upstairs and downstairs. I even did the dusting. <laughs> and by the time she was coming home, I was gonna make her something special, whatever it is that she wanted. I was gonna make that for dinner. And so in preparation of that, the kids were, I wanted to feed the kids. So I, I got one of those big frozen pizzas and put that in and they are sitting down after the pizza's done and they're sitting around the table eating that. And she comes home and she goes, and she hadn't had a very good day. There was a lot that had happened. And she goes, is that all there is? And he said, I kept score of everything that I had done to win husband of the year. And let's just say it didn't go well from that point on. <laughs> and, but that's the thing. When we are instead, he said, if I would have approached all of the effort that I was doing, and it was legitimate effort and it was great, but if I would have approached it to, she's working so hard. She does these 12-hour shifts all the time. She takes care of our kids so well. She is a great mom. It is a joy to me to now be able to give whatever it is to her. And that's the difference is the happiest couples. That was one thing that it sometimes took a while, like to change that mindset and focus on what the other person is giving. But I can promise you, if you will look for it, you will see it everywhere. And it'll build that sense of gratitude that we are told to live in with our spouse and, you know, the truth, we have some big implications of what we've just shared. Yeah. You know? Well, here's the other thing. We live in a world that we want to impact for Christ. Some of us perhaps are gifted evangelists. Some of us feel less so, more nervous about sharing our faith with others. The way that you can represent the kingdom of God and our love of our Father by in your relationships, handling them well and honoring one another, that's appealing to the world. They want what we have. Yeah. So maybe, can we end with praying for the, the marriages of this church? Love that. Is that all right? So let's just pray for a minute. Give us a chance to just pray for, for you guys and all of the marriages here. Lord, um, thank you for this chance to share with these amazing people who you have called your own. Lord, and for those who are listening, who they may not be so sure of whether they are called your own, Lord, Lord, may this be the day that they make that step, they take that decision. Lord, we pray for every single marriage represented here, whether it is a marriage that is absolutely delightful every day or whether there is a marriage that is struggling or whether there is a marriage yet to come represented by the people here. Lord, do what only you can do and fill these marriages with the power of your Holy Spirit so that they are healed and strengthened to be able to show that a, to show a watching world that following you makes a difference. Amen and amen. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys for inviting us to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, let's give them a round of applause one more time. Amen. And um, right after uh, the service, uh, they, they do have books. You'll be able to um, get them in our overflow. But I want you to rise to your feet right now. 
How many of you feel more hopeful, encouraged about marriage? How many of you, how many of you, of you men are like, I'm getting married this year. This is my year. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but it's going to be a good year for um, a lot of good marriages. And we're so grateful for the investment that Jeff and Shanti uh, gave into our church, into our marriages, to everyone watching online. And um, I do believe that um, each one of you should get these books so that you will debunk and just remove all these myths that we've been uh, poisoned with and believe uh, some facts and truth and just walk in hope. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I want to give an opportunity right now. Something that is very important in our church is um, every Sunday people come in for the first time. Some people come week in, week out. And maybe you came to a service like this today and you don't know the Lord Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Perhaps I've talked to people yesterday and they said this was our last night and, and we're getting divorced if nothing changed. People like that come to service all the time. I can't tell you how many people I've met who said, I will take my life on Monday. I'm going to go to church one more time on Sunday. If nothing changes there, um, I'm going to take my life. And these are not some far-fetched stories that I hear once in 10 years. I hear them more regularly than you imagine. Some of you brought a friend today, maybe with you in the second or first century, and maybe you don't know Jesus. Hearing this today, hearing the story of a young lady who came to a service such as this one, set on the back, battling with depression, experiencing something she could not explain, and saying yes to the Lord, and seeing the shift and change. Jesus didn't come to give us religion, He came to give us life. And He came to give us life that's more abundant. He brings us a different kingdom. In His kingdom, He reigns. Not your sickness, not your past, not even you. Jesus is the King in His kingdom and we are loved by Jesus. He's not a Lord that dominates. He's the Lord that died for us. We all are sinners. We say that even if you don't believe in God, you still say nobody's perfect. That's you acknowledging you're a sinner. <laughs> yeah. And if we were to judge you or me by Ten Commandments, all of us will flunk and will fail. There is a God. He is just and He is good. God cannot take your sin, put it under the carpet and let you go to heaven. It would make Him a corrupt judge. The same way the local judge, if He takes your crime, let's say somebody commits a crime against you and He says, oh yeah, no big deal. Um, you wouldn't be saying like, oh yeah, we have a great judge in town. You're saying, no, we have a corrupt judge. Let's do a protest and let's do a crusade and a campaign to get him out. God is not corrupt, will never become corrupt for anybody. He's holy and righteous, which puts you in a problem. Because he's going to judge you for your sin. He's going to judge me for my sin. And the Bible says already looking ahead, the judgment for that sin is death. Not your funeral, it's separation from God. So what God did is He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to become a human, take your sin, my sin, the punishment we deserve, suffer that on the cross 2,000 years ago, so that you and I can have a chance to have a relationship with the God who made us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So that's what really what Christianity is. It's not trying to be better. This is not a religion of trying. It's a faith where we trust in who He is. The weight is lifted. Our sins are forgiven. We walk into a new relationship. You may say, well, what's going to happen? I'm living with my boyfriend. We're going to worry about that tomorrow. Today, what matters is this. Where do you stand with God? I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. This is not an emotional appeal. I want to appeal to your heart. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you have not embraced the free gift of salvation, I want to give you that opportunity today. Maybe you're here today and your life has literally hit, hit rock bottom. You may be consider yourself uh, someone that believes in God, perhaps Catholic or some other faith. That doesn't matter today. What matters is this. Have you placed your trust in Jesus? Have you been forgiven of your sins? Going to church cannot save you. Like going to McDonald's doesn't make you a burger. You got to give your life to the Lord. Maybe you used to have a relationship with God as a teenager and college happened, stuff happened, abuse happened, maybe church politics got involved, your family went through stuff, you prayed for things that didn't happen and you found yourself today broken and you're ready to come back home to the Heavenly Father. 
You're ready to be forgiven. You're ready to be restored. He loves you. He wants to forgive you and renew you. Would you give me the opportunity today to lead you into that relationship? If you're in one of these two camps where you need to give your life to Jesus or come back to the Lord. When I count to three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. That's going to be your way saying, I need Jesus. I need God. I need to be forgiven. I need to come back home. One, two, three. Just raise that hand high. Slip that hand high if you're saying, this is me. Thank you. I see your hand. In a second, thank you. Just raise that hand high. My goal isn't to embarrass you. My goal is today for you to encounter the Lord. Thank you. I see your hand. Those of you online as well, just drop that in the chat. Say, hey, I would like to give my life to the Lord. Appreciate you. You can put your hand down. Now I'm going to ask you to do a bold step. If you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to come forward. If you came with a friend, just come with them. Just come. Do not be afraid. Do not be ashamed. You may say, why would you do that publicly? Jesus says, if you confess me publicly, I'll confess you before my Father. Jesus died publicly. You can't live for Jesus here. You will never live for Him there. Just come forward. We celebrate that. Come on. Amen. In the second sanctuary as well, just make your way forward. Don't be afraid. We love you. We appreciate you. And we celebrate a decision to say yes to the Lord. Amen. God bless you, young man. I love your hair. Amen. And then there's, an, there's another person, second sanctuary as well. Just come forward. God bless you guys. God bless you. If I can invite our life group leaders to step forward as well. All the life group leaders, let's come forward. If you brought a friend with you today and on the way to church, you've been talking about this decision. You can turn to them and say, hey, is he talking to you? If they nod their heads, say, let's go together. Friends don't let friends go to hell. Come on, somebody. Amen. We help people to meet Jesus. And the life is changed. Life is transformed. And both in the first, the second sanctuary and those of you online. Right now, I want you to get ready to pray a prayer. Now, I'm going to tell you guys right away. Prayer doesn't save anybody. <laughs> All right. What saves us is Jesus. But we as humans, we pray and Jesus hears our prayer. I cannot judge the faith in your heart. God does that. But the Bible says we believe with our heart and we speak with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. I want you to stretch your hands. There's nothing magical about stretching your hands. It's kind of like when you see, if I'm giving you a gift, you stretch your hands. Stretch your hands toward the Lord right now. Let me pray with you. Say this out loud with me. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, I believe you are the Son of God who came on this earth and died on that cross for my sin. You were buried and you rose again. And I believe you are coming back. I repent of my sin for the way I lived my life. Wash me with your blood. My heart, my conscience and my life. Cleanse me. Remove the weight of my shame and guilt and my sin. I turn my life to you. I invite you as my Lord and my Savior. I come into your kingdom today. Deliver me from chains, demons, addictions, generational curses, anything that holds me back. Help me, Lord and fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Right now, our team is going to talk to you for just one minute. And if you can follow Danny, and we will just pray for you just for one more minute. Um, so can we give a round of applause to all of them right now? Life group leaders, could you follow them? Life group leaders. In the second sanctuary, we'll meet you there in the common area as well. We just want to pray with you for a little bit more and just talk to you, let you know what just happened. Amen. Church, we want to remind you today as you exit this week is our life groups week. And somebody say life groups. If you haven't found a life group, make sure you find a life group. And then we also want to remind you at 6 o'clock or 5.30 on Tuesday, we're doing our last pour um, in our new building. We would love to see you there. Better is not good enough. The best is yet to come. Give somebody a high five. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday.